welcome. Grab your favorite morning beverage and join us for Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. You don't know me, but I'm your brother. Sampling the news desserts of the week, here is your host, Jim Santel. Good morning, America. Good morning, Wisconsin, the great Midwest, cities, towns, villages throughout our area. My name is Jim Santel. I'm here with you on this bright and beautiful Saturday morning in downtown Waukesha. I'm at the WAUK radio studios, the Shaw in Waukesha, 540 AM, 101 FM. I'm joined here in the studios this morning, as always, by my producer, Connor. Delighted to have him with me. And thanking, once again, Mike Kruth, the owner-operator of this wonderful radio station, for affording me this opportunity to come into your lives and spend some time in discussion with you every Saturday morning from 9 to 11, including this morning, when our agenda is ambitious, but as always, a Achievable. We'll chat about that in just a moment. It is Saturday, July 30th, 2022. This is the 211th day of our calendar year. As always, we begin with some history to start off our discussion, our time together this morning. And we recall that a number of very significant things happen in contemporary life in America, and many things in ancient history happened as well on this day in history. In the year 762, the modern, the modern city of Baghdad, where I spent some time back in 2006 to 2008, was founded and its present location right along the Tigris River there in the middle of the Iraqi nation in Mesopotamia. 1729, jumping ahead about a thousand years, a city in this country, in the United States of America, was founded. The city of Baltimore was founded on this day in 1729. We chat a lot about academics and books as we're going to do today. Today is also an important day in the history of books. In 1935, it was the time that the first pen Penguin books in paperback were published for America. Ten different books, different varieties, many of them still classics to this day, 1935. The first paperbacks in America, a tradition that continues to this day, 1945, a very sober and somber event happened. The USS Indianapolis went down in the Pacific Ocean. About 880 crew members died in that, including uh, many who were lost to the shark-infested waters as we know from history, USS Indianapolis going down in 1945. 1965, President Lyndon Baines Johnson signs the Medicare bill, became effective in 1966. 1971 was the year on this day, July 30th, that Apollo 15 landed on the moon. Apollo 15 on this day in 1971. A couple of more significant events. It was on this day in 2018, not that long ago, when Malaysian Airlines 370 disappeared in the investigation, still unsolved to this day. Continued, began that day, continuing to this day to try to figure out what happened to the plainly the victims of that plane crash someplace in the Pacific Ocean, presumably. And in 2020, 2020, also a somber day in American history, in national history, in international history as well. We recognize the significant contributions of former congressman and civil rights advocate uh, John Lewis. His funeral, his memorial service was held this day on 2020. And as we know, John Lewis, not only this civil rights icon in American history, um, but also, also his name is attached to this day to some of the major pieces of legislation that are attempted attempted to correct the decisions of the United States Supreme Court in a couple of cases that basically eviscerated the Voting Rights Act of 1965, a case called Shelby County, another one called Brnovich from just last year. We've chatted about those as well. Today was the day back in 2020, two years ago, and we thought about John Lewis, his legacy in America. Uh, former President uh, Barack Obama per- delivered the eulogy on that day. So today, once again, Saturday, July 30th, 2022. Thank you so much for joining me, spending a couple of hours with me this morning or whatever time your calendar, your schedule today permits. As I said, we do have, we do have an ambitious 
but much achievable agenda. We're going to spend the first hour or so following up on the second component, the second wave, if you will, of the discussion that we began last Saturday. Last Saturday, talking about academics, talking about the importance of the First Amendment in our nation to this day. And the second hour, we're also going to chat about the First Amendment more broadly speaking and its aspect when it comes to religion. And in particular, in particular, we're going to be talking about an upcoming anniversary this week, this week, it was August 5th, 2012, that a gunman walked into the Sikh Gurdwara in our neighboring community in Oak Creek right here in southeastern Wisconsin and killed seven people and injured many more and changed the life and the livelihood and the arc of our community, our state, and also our nation, our world. And all of those, all of those are going to be looking to southeastern Wisconsin Wisconsin, and the Gurdwara in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, this coming weekend. Friday is the 10-year anniversary, the 10-year observance of the horrific hate crimes violence at the Sikh Gurdwara that took those lives, injured, injured many more. But nonetheless, in the spirit of uh, Chardi Kala, which we will chat about, about in our second hour this coming Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The community, broadly speaking, the membership, the leadership of the Sick Good Warrior is going to be observing solemnly but also drawing lessons, talking about the events of that horrific morning, Sunday, August 12, 2012, uh, 5th of 2012, and then also drawing some lessons from what we know today about not only shootings and violence, all too frequent, all too common in the United States of America. Also chatting, however, about the ascendancy that has come from that, from the community, from the nation, from the state, from all of us who took from that horrific experience some things about humanity and the ways in which we come together, even in the midst of terrible tragedy, to move forward and think about the future. Young people, middle-aged people, older people, we're going to chat a lot about that in the second hour this morning here on Morning Cannolis at WAUK, the Shaw in downtown Waukesha. And as always, we're going to be taking your questions, your comments, your thoughts throughout the two-hour period at 844-967-2789. That number, once again, 844-967-2789. Welcoming, as always, your thoughts, your comments, your questions. Connor is at the wheel, and he will be directing your comments and questions to me. Looking forward to chatting with you this morning in Waukesha. So let's begin. Let's begin the second portion of our discussion about a First Amendment issue established by people like George Mason and James Madison many years ago, 1789, ratified by the states in 1791. What do we know about Article 1, the first article of the Bill of Rights in our Constitution, one of 27 amendments to our Constitution, it says Congress, and by that the courts have understood that to mean any federal government, state government, local government, government generally shall make no law, to, shall do nothing respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. And again, we're going to be chatting mostly about freedom of speech this morning, talking a lot also in our second hour about freedom of religion and the capacity not only of the Sikh faith to observe their faith, but people of all faiths and of all affiliations with churches and synagogues, temples, and mosques around our nation throughout the world to observe their faiths as they feel appropriate. The First Amendment establishing those fundamental rights to speech, to discussion, to exchange in the common practice of engaging with other people about ideas, concepts that are important to us, and prompted this entire discussion, which we began last week, about academics and the rights that students and teachers have inside the academic setting, prompted by three things. One is, of course, as we know well, the start of the new school year for most schools in Wisconsin and many others around the nation. Going back to school in late August, to some in early September, about a month from now. So that's one of the initiating prompts that uh, encourages us to talk about academics and the First Amendment last time and again today. We're also very much in mind of the recent Supreme Court case in a case called Kennedy versus Bremerton. This is the 
litigation and the decision by a majority of the Supreme Court that seized upon the first article of the Bill of Rights that establishes the freedom of religion and also prohibits the establishment of religion, found that this coach in Seattle, Washington, did in fact have a constitutional right to engage in prayer at the 50-yard line of a football field after the game, along with probably 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 of his team members. A very notorious and famous case now because of the visuals on that. Supreme Court finding that indeed under the first article, the first of the Bill of Rights, that he does, that coach does have the right to pray, to pray in that setting, even in a public school, in a public setting, and said that the decisions by the school and the school board and the school entities, the superintendent, to discipline him for, from their perspective, um, violating, if you will, the, the separation of church and state, a position that they advocated for effectively and, and very, very vigorously before the Supreme Court, that, that their concerns about that establishment were actually overtaken by the Supreme Court's articulation of this view that the, the coach himself had a right of freedom of expression and freedom of exercise of his religion, permitted to pray in that setting, prompting an awful lot of people to look at that case and think, Jagash, uh, what about the prohibitions of prayer and Bible reading, for example, in schools, in public schools to this day? We'll chat about then, that again in a little bit. And indeed, in the wake of that particular case of a couple of weeks ago, blurring, if you will, from many perspectives, this distinction between church and state. We know that in Michigan, there's a superintendent pondering whether coaches should lead students in prayer. In Florida, there's a school board member who wants her district to teach students about prayer and offer religious studies. In, ha in Hawaii, the leader of a faith and family-focused activism group is looking for an alteration state policy on the initiation of prayer and on campus. So that, too, prompting a lot of our discussion this morning. And finally, another discussion out of Maine, likewise addressing this issue. We're going to be talking about all of that right after the break. Join us here at WAUK, the Shaw 101 FM, 540 AM, 844-967-2789. This is Jim Santel at the studios of WAUK Radio in downtown Waukesha. Thanks so much for joining me this morning, a bright and beautiful morning in Waukesha. We're chatting this morning in our first hour about academics in America, the First Amendment rights to freedom of speech and expression, and we're mindful of a number of cases coming out of the United States Supreme Court in which the court most recently said once again that the First Amendment's protections extend to teachers and students alike, neither of whom shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. Right before the break, we were chatting about a couple of those cases coming out of the state of Washington and also the state of Maine. We know that right here in Waukesha County, we also have an issue related to academics as we go into the new academic year. It has to be, it happens to be in the city of Muskego, right here in Waukesha. A wonderful community, about 24,000 people, the fifth largest community in Waukesha County. There, as many of us know, there is a dispute. There is a disagreement. There is a lot of advocacy for the teaching of a book written by Julie Atsuka called When the Emperor Was Divine. It has to do with the internment of Japanese American citizens during World War II in internment camps in the western portions of our nation and describes in particular that experience suffered by members of our Asian American community at that time a novel that has a story, an account that has gotten an awful lot of awards and was previously 
on the reading list for the Muskego High School English class. Uh, the superintendent and the school board and other leaders in the Muskego Norway School District have taken that book off of the a curriculum for the coming school year, prompting a lot of disagreement, a lot of discussion, including including a major protest just this past week. About 150 community members gathering at the Muskego Educational Service Center in Wisconsin to protest the school board's decision to ban, again, Julie Atsuka's award-winning 2002 novel, When the Emperor Was Divine. And so we, we are thoughtful, we're mindful of that issue as well in our own community, having to do with freedom of expression, freedom of access to information in our schools, our public schools, and other places of learning and instruction and growth. And so that is what prompts both last week and again for the remainder of our hour this morning, our first hour this morning, our discussion about what the Supreme Court has said about freedom of expression, freedom of access to materials, and the right to have those freedoms expressed and pursued in our academic settings. We talked at great length last time, last Saturday, about what the First Amendment does in fact say and chatted about these distinctions between, for example, protected and unprotected speech and noted there are certain things that are not protected by the First Amendment. Those include things like fighting words and threats of violence and so forth, child pornography, which of course are not inside the protections of the First Amendment. Uh, freedom of expression and speech and so forth. And then there's also this distinction between content-based speech and content-neutral speech, content-neutral restrictions that have to do with the time and place and the the circumstances under which speech can be delivered. Content-based speech, of course, is the content itself, the substance of what is being said. The Supreme Court has basically said that you can make distinctions, for the most part, based upon content-neutral considerations. And as we talked last Last week, we found that generally, generally, school schools, public schools, are in fact uh, are, are, are they are certainly public forums, but they're non-public forums in the sense that uh, inside those institutions, all the trappings, all the full trappings that you would have in a in a fully public forum, like a park or on a, a street or a sidewalk uh, in America, they do not attach. And so, one of the questions we began to ask last week was, um, how are schools? Uh, classified, including this non-public forum approach, and then how do we figure out, how do we figure out what is in fact permitted inside of public schools to these days, and what is not? Again, thinking not only about Muskego, but also about schools in the state of Washington and Maine, other places around our nation. Also noting, of course, that there are these distinctions between publicly funded institutions and privately supported institutions, which are not, which are not, for the most part, covered by the first Amendment, and for that reason, also an important distinction to make. And so as we were finishing up last week, we were chatting about a number of different cases in which the Supreme Court has defined some of this, told us what this all means. We recall well the case of uh, Burnett. Uh, West Virginia versus Burnett in 1943, a 6-3 to vote that overturned a state law in West Virginia that required all public school students to salute the flag and recite the uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Again, in a public school, the Supreme Court says you cannot do that. Justice Jackson talking about this notion of free speech in our schools being a a fixed star in our constitutional constellation. Again, a very important case way back in 1943. We talked again as I made mention earlier, of these two very, very significant landmark cases in the 1960s, 1962, a case called Engel versus Vitale, in which the Supreme Court once again rejected, prohibited uh, state laws that mandated prayer in school. That was 1962. And then one year later, an Abington School District versus Shep. Uh, finding that the reading, the public organized reading of the Bible in schools was contrary to the Constitution. Again, not that you can't do that as an individual if you choose to do so, but it's the institutionalized, the very public and the very uh, authorized doing of that, uh, praying and reading uh, from the Bible and presumably other books of religious uh, origin. And then in uh, 1968, a few years later, in a case called Epperson versus Arkansas, uh, the high court also found 
found that a state law that banned the teaching of evolution in public schools was a violation of the Establishment Clause. And finally, as we were breaking last Saturday, we were chatting about this case called Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District, 1969, in which this fundamental notion. Again, I repeat it once again because it is so important. Hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gates. We chatted about this material notion that uh, the, the young woman, who was Mary Beth Tinker at the time, way back in 1968, 1969, wanted to organize a protest to the Vietnam War, did so. The Supreme Court supported her and said, indeed, uh, that does not impose a material or substantive interference on the process of education and found that she had that right inside the public schools to protest in that way, contrary to what the superintendent and the school board said about all of that. Uh, when we come back, we'll chat about a couple more cases and then turn more recently to some very recent, recent decisions of the Supreme Court with respect to the student rights inside our public schools in America. Stay with us. WAUK, The Shah. This is Morning Cannolis. We're taking your calls at 844-967-2789. Once again, Jim Santel, Morning Cannolis. We're chatting in this first hour of our time together about academics in the United States of America, right here in Waukesha, other places around the country. We're chatting right before the break about this course of Supreme Court cases, including Tinker, in which the Supreme Court said that teachers and students do not, in fact, shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech when they move through the schoolhouse gate. And talking in specific about this case involving Mary Beth Tinker, who was 13 years old at the time that she organized a protest of the Vietnam War. The Supreme Court saying, no, no, that does not in fact accomplish a material or substantive interference with the conduct of academic pursuits in that school district, permitting her to go ahead. And so in the wake of Tinker, what happened? What was the, the course of conduct after Tinker by the United States Supreme Court and beyond? Well, the United States Supreme Court began to reject some student claims under the First Amendment, emphasizing what it described the role of public schools in inculcating values and promoting civic virtues. So we know, for example, that in 1968, almost contemporaneous with, with Tinker, the High Court uh, did in fact find that school officials can decide on some specific curricular topics and other student expression when it occurs, for example, in assembly. That was the case of Bethel School District versus Fraser in 1968. And also, perhaps even more interesting, the Supreme Court said in a case, a very important case called Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer in 1988, a couple of decades later, that in fact a school district does have the school officials, principals, school officials, and, and uh, school board members have some authority when it comes to the content of school and student newspapers. Could in fact do some, some censoring, if you will, some decision-making about what is and is not in student newspapers. Again, that was Hazelwood. All of this respect to students in schools. And so we've got some more recent cases. 2007, about 15 years ago, in a case called Morris versus Frederick. Fairly colorful case 
again, coming out of our United States Supreme Court, on this question of what students can and cannot do under the First Amendment in public schools. Supreme Court said that public school officials could indeed prohibit student speech that they reasonably thought would promote illegal drug use, illegal drug use. And Supreme Court said, no, you can, in fact, limit some of the expressions there. In this case, a banner in the school, arguably promoting illegal drug use. Supreme Court saying you can limit that in the First Amendment without running afoul of the protections in that first article of the Bill of Rights. And then interestingly, going, if not necessarily in the opposite direction, but a different set of facts, in 2021, just last year, a fairly notorious case called Mahoney Area School District versus BL, BL, the initials of a young woman who was a cheerleader, and she was upset about the fact that she was not selected to serve on the varsity cheerleading team, went out and uh, placed on her social media posts some vulgar objections to that decision not to go ahead with her placement on the varsity team. The question was whether or not the school district could sanction her, could prohibit her from being on the team entirely. And just last year, 2021, once again, the Supreme Court went, if you will, in the opposite direction, said, you know what, because she was doing this off campus, social media, not necessarily quite uh, right inside the school confines, if you will, that they could not, in fact, discipline her. And so it was a, a statement in support of her rights under the First Amendment, even to say something vulgar, even to say something that's very contrary to the perhaps the best interest from the school district's perspective of their position, but nonetheless, a wonderful expression of the possibilities and the options that stay with students inside the schools uh, with respect to the First Amendment. We've got, admittedly, a bit of a mixed bag out there, but nonetheless, a very very clear articulation, once again, that students inside public schools do have free speech rights. They vary depending upon the type of expression that is, the location of it, its impact, all kinds of things that the Supreme Court takes into consideration in deciding those cases. And all of those, again, with respect to, to students in our public schools. Next question, of course, is what about teachers? What about teachers? We talked before about this matter in Muskego, and teachers, interested interested in teaching this award-winning book having to do with the internment of Asian Americans during World War II. Can teachers do that? Can students read that book in a public setting, in that public venue, a very organized way? And so many of these issues very much at play right here in Waukesha County. And you'll not be surprised to learn that the Supreme Court relies a lot on the student cases to figure out what the rights of teachers are, the rights of teachers. And they are somewhat more limited, but nonetheless, as the Supreme Court has said, again repeated recently in the Bremerton High School football coach case, that teachers also do not shed their First Amendment rights when they walk through the schoolhouse doors. And so the question is, what are those rights? How far do they go? Are they the same as they would attach to students? And as I indicated, a little bit different. But nonetheless, a lot of the same principles apply. No doubt also that when it comes to teachers and indeed students, as you move from public schools, uh, K through 12, and into colleges and universities, the Supreme Court for the most part says more liberties, uh, more expression permitted because of the nature of colleges and universities, a little bit more locked down, if you will, in high schools and in the grades before that. But in a case called Pickering versus Board of Education, 1968, probably one of the first times that the Supreme Court wrestled, again, at the, the same time it's wrestling with, with the rights of students in, under the First Amendment, a, a Supreme Court justice, again, an icon named Thurgood Marshall, had a lot to say about the rights of teachers under the First Amendment. The petitioning teacher in that case had been dismissed by her school district for authoring a letter to the editor of a local newspaper, she was being critical of the school board for its allocations of monies, its public funds uh, between academics and athletics, complaining basically sports getting too much, academics not getting enough. She authored this letter into the public domain, uh, published in a local newspaper critical of the school district, of the school board, superintendent. The question is, can she do that? She is employed by the school district. She's a teacher there. 
What about her First Amendment rights? Uh, how far do they go? How do they attach? And Thurgood Marshall, in one of the great articulations of the rights of teachers also, like those of students in America, said this. He said, the interest of the school administration in limiting teachers' opportunities to contribute to public debate, debate is not, not greater than its interest in limiting a similar contribution by any member of the general public. Now, that may sound a little bit uh, serpentine, a little bit uh, circuitous, if you will, in, in its uh, description. Basically, what the Supreme Court, what Justice Marshall was saying then is, you know, teachers, when it comes to these kinds of expressions, again, do not shed their rights pretty much the same as the general public, perhaps in publishing a letter in the local newspaper, being critical of a community school board. And so really leveling the playing field in this case called Pickering, Pickering versus Board of Education 1968. And sure enough, Pickering does have some precedential impact following up on that particular year. And in 1979, about 11 years later, in a case called Gavan, G-I-V-H-A-N versus Western Line, Consolidated School District. At that time, the Supreme Court reinstated, put back in place, put back in litigation, a, a First Amendment claim of an educator, a teacher in the state of Mississippi. That teacher had been discharged, again dismissed, after complaining to her principal about racial discrimination in the school district. So she complains to her school leadership about the fact that people of color are not be give, being given the same opportunities, which they should, in fact, be given, of course, as we know well, under Board versus uh, 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 Brown versus Board of Education. And uh, the Supreme Court says, you know what? Uh, once again, the, the school teacher does not lose her free speech rights simply because she chose to speak on an issue of public concern to her employer directly rather than to the public at large. Makes this, this somewhat curious distinction between public exposition and private exposition. Says, no, in fact, the teacher does have that right, again, following up on Pickering. And then we also have this issue about discipline of teachers. Uh, in case involving a Hazelwood, once again, coming back from the student side of the ledger. And right after the break, we're going to chat about what that means. What about discipline imposed upon teachers who might have some obligations inside the classroom? Not just letters, not just things said in the public domain. What about teachers' responsibilities of free speech inside the classroom. Right after the break, we'll chat about the implications of Hazelwood, the student case, when it comes to teacher rights under the First Amendment, right here at WAUK, the Shaw Morning Cannolis. Join us after the break, uh, 844-967-2789, as we continue this discussion this morning of all of these issues under the First Amendment of the United States uh, Constitution. Once again, in our final segment of this first hour on Morning Cannolis, we're chatting, talking this morning about the First Amendment, and in particular, the rights that's still attached to students and most recently now teachers in public schools. We were talking right before the break about this all-important case called Pickering, in which Thurgood Marshall said that the interest of school administrators in limiting teachers' opportunities to talk about things in public debate um, is not greater than that with respect to people in the public domain generally, non-teachers. And so the question is, uh, what does that mean in practical terms? What does that mean for teachers in America today? We know once again, reaching back to our previous discussion, that in a case called Hazelwood, the Supreme Court said that with respect to to students, that administrators and, and uh, principals, uh, school districts can in fact censor, 
can in fact limit what appears in student newspapers. And in fact, in the wake of Pickering, this very broad, broad statement about the rights of teachers to speak out and to have their First Amendment rights understood and supported in public schools, the courts began to go somewhat in the opposite direction. And in particular, used Hazelwood, Hazelwood, for example, in one of the Court of Appeals in the Eighth Circuit to find that indeed a school district could impose some discipline upon a teacher. In that particular case, a case called LAX, L-A-C-K-A-K-S, versus Ferguson Reorganized School District, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, again, this is not the Supreme Court, but the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, using using the decision in Hazelwood, the student case about newspapers, said that the, the school district could, in fact, fire a Missouri teacher for failing to censor her school students in the classroom. And the Eighth Circuit at that time said a flat prohibition on profanity in the class is reasonably related uh, to a reasonable pedagogical concern. And for that reason, that promotes some generally acceptable social and academic standards. There's a legitimate academic, ac- academic and educational purpose in doing that. And so used Hazelwood, again, this student case, applied it to teachers and found that indeed there are some limits on what teachers can or cannot do inside the class classroom found that that particular school district in Missouri could indeed sanction the school teacher for not properly censoring her students inside her classroom. And in the wake of that, again, we've got this question then about which which standard applies. Is it Hazelwood or is it this Pickering case? And again, in which Thurgood Marshall said, you know, you've got an awful lot of teachers who do have rights under the First Amendment and those rights should be observed. Well, we've got a little bit of additional insight. In 1991, a few years after the case was decided, uh, previously, a case called Miles versus Denver Public Schools, the Tenth Circuit, another appeals court, not the Supreme Court, uh, concluded that a, a public school teacher there could be sanctioned for talking about declining discipline and spreading a rumor about a student's intimate conduct on a tennis court. So again, education inside the classroom, conduct inside the classroom, things the teachers said, and the Tenth Circuit, again, not the the Supreme Court, but an appeals court using using. Hazelwood said that because of the special characteristics of a classroom environment, Hazelwood and the limitations, the possibilities of administrators imposing discipline, those hold. And we specifically find that the teachers' classroom expression and their their uh, exhibition of their First Amendment rights um, can, in fact, be limited um, because, indeed, there's a legitimate academic purpose in doing that. And this particular kind of speech by teachers uh, should not be permitted. And so again, a little bit of a, a difference in direction between Hazelwood and Pickering. Um, another variation on all of this comes out of a case unrelated to academics, but a case in 2006 called Garcetti, Garcetti by the Supreme Court, that said that public employees do not retain First Amendment pro- protections for speech as a component of their official job duties. Well, teachers in the public setting plainly are public uh, public employees. Employees. And the question is, does Garcetti, which really wasn't an academic case, wasn't really a school case, does that apply? Does that mean it basically wipes out Pickering and says that what Thurgood Marshall said about the capacity of teachers to, to speak and to be open under the First Amendment, was that wiped out? And, and yet the Supreme Court, even in that case, uh, recognized that its limitations uh, might be real, the limitations of Garcetti in the academic setting as to teachers. And so the majority in that case acknowledged that this raises some other concerns. They've specifically said there is an argument that expression related to academic scholarship or classroom instruction implicates additional constitutional interests that are not fully accounted for by this court's customary employee speech jurisprudence, a long and perhaps very complicated way of saying, you know what, we've got to think about this more, and maybe that public employee limitation does not imply um, that school teachers uh, can be disciplined and should be sanctioned if, in fact, the school administrators feel they, they have somehow run a foul of, of uh, rules and regulations. And so we've got, again, this somewhat mixed bag about what's coming out of the Supreme Court and Courts of Appeals. Our own Court of Appeals in 2016 in a case called Brown versus Chicago Board of Education 
said that the uh, teacher had no First Amendment protection from discipline. Uh, the teacher there had been disciplined for using an offensive racial slur as an illustration in a fairly well-intentioned lecture, um, instructing students not to use, not to use that slur. And the uh, Court of Appeals in Chicago, again, the Seventh Circuit, which covers Wisconsin and Indiana um, and Illinois, basically says because of Car- Garcetti, this public, public employee prohibition, the teacher's free speech claim fails right out of the gate, the appeals court said. And so, once again, uh, language in the academic setting, uh, not necessarily uh, clear with respect to what we would do going forward, but we do know, we do know once again, as the Supreme Court recently said in the Bremerton case, that teachers do not, in fact, shed their First Amendment rights when they walk into the school district, when they walk into the school buildings and take responsibility for their class. Probably a very broad distinction between things that are done right inside the classroom, words, expressions, things that are engaged in with students, and a distinction made perhaps between things done outside, letters to an editor, for example, uh, comments to a supervisor about discrimination in the schools, things that are not done right inside the academic setting itself. Uh, Those, it seems, that the Supreme Court will give um, an awful lot of protection to more, more uh, possibilities for supervisors, school boards, principals, others to impose limitations upon teachers for things that they may say and that they may do inside the classroom itself when students are there. And again, this case um, out of the A circuit called Lax, probably the best example of that, um, implying that Hazelwood does in fact uh, limit, limit, if you will, the rights of teachers when it comes to their First Amendment rights. And so we know that there is indeed um, a First Amendment right of teachers, certainly of students inside classrooms. And we know as well, we know as well that there are other nations on the face of the planet that likewise wrestle with these issues on a regular basis. We know, for example, that the United Nations itself, in taking a look at not only what we do here in the United States of America, but in other countries around the world, has said in its Declaration of Human Rights, said this, everyone, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion opinion and expression. This right, this right, the United Nations has said, includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information through any media and regardless of frontiers, regardless of frontiers. That, of course, the United Nations exposition of what we would regard as the First Amendment right uh, under the Constitution of the United States of America, free expression, freedom of the press, also a part of that, and and we also know uh, the First Amendment chocked full of these very important rights written by James Madison and others in the first years of our nation um, also conveys with it this right of freedom of religious uh, exercise along with the prohibition on the government to establish a religion. And so as we conclude our first hour this morning and talking about academics, we look forward to the next hour and our discussion in another setting, a much more somber setting about this event that happened in southeastern Wisconsin on August 5th of 2012. We're going to be talking more about the exercise of religion, the possibility and the right Uh, given to all Americans of all faiths to exercise their faiths as they choose without involvement of the government and also should be free from violence, right? Free from the people who would try to stop them, to try to, to inhibit that free exercise of religion. We know, we know that 10 years ago, right about now, on August 5th of 2012, we know well that a gunman, a white supremacist, walked into the sick Gurdwara in Oak Creek, right here in Wisconsin, and tried to limit the freedom of expression, freedom of religion, the expression of the sick faith by the members of the congregation there at the Gurdwara, which is the temple in Oak Creek, and killed seven members of that congregation, six of them on that day, another who survived for a long period of time and more recently died, injured many others at that time as well. And as a result of that, in the coming week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, our state, our community, 
our nation and indeed our world is going to be thinking again, not only about the First Amendment, this important uh, right of all peoples, should they choose to do so, to exercise their freedom of religion as they, as they may elect, of all faiths in this nation, and the freedom to do that without interference, not only by the government, but also from others who would try to stop them from doing that. Uh, this coming weekend, once again, an observance of all of those principles when we think about the people who were killed, who were murdered at that time, and then also the lessons learned. And so in our second hour coming up in just a few minutes, we're going to chat more about the observance coming up here in just a few days of the Sikh Gurdwara, the civil rights importance of that issue for America, for Wisconsin, for the entire world. So join us. Uh, Welcome. Grab your favorite morning beverage and join us for Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. You don't know me, but I'm your brother. Sampling the news desserts of the week, here is your host, Jim Santel. Good morning once again. This is Jim Santel. I'm in the studios of WAUK Radio in downtown Waukesha. We're at 101 FM, 510 AM. We're also taking your callers in this second hour of our time together this morning on July 30th, 2022. That phone number once again is 844-967-2789. Following our first hour discussion about the First Amendment rights of teachers and students in our public schools in America, America. Under the First Amendment, freedom of expression, freedom of speech. We're going to be continuing that, that general theme and pursuing yet another aspect of the First Amendment, which is the right to pursue, to exercise one's faith without government interference and the obligation on government not to establish a religion in any way that would implicate or otherwise affect that proper expression, that exercise of religion in America. And in particular, we're going to explore this next hour and then again all of our next time together next Saturday in talking about this major significant event that happened on August 5th of 2012 in Wisconsin, in Oak Creek, in the United States of America and for the entire world, which looked at what happened and to this day, to this day, drawing lessons from even as we memorialize those people lost and remember and recall the injuries suffered by many others to this day at the Sick Temple shooting in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. We're going to be spending all of this hour providing you with some background about who the six are, what their faith is all about, and then at the end of this hour, I'm going to give you some sense of what's going to be happening this coming weekend as the world's attention, our nation's attention, and the state's attention is turned to Oak Creek and to this wonderful place of religion, of faith in Oak Creek, and to other good waras, and to other other places of religious exercise throughout the United States of America of all faiths, of all persuasions. And so let's begin our discussion today, as always, taking your calls and comments, questions as they may arise about six in the world and six in the United States, including those right here in Wisconsin. Let's talk a little bit about the sick faith or sickism in and of itself. An awful lot of great information out there. Let me begin by offering this recommendation as well. Very proud, very honored to have been a part of a group for the past year or so that finally in April of this past year was delighted to present to the community of Oak Creek, to Wisconsin, frankly to the entire nation, a wonderful new opportunity for learning. It is at the Oak Creek Library in Drexel Square in downtown Oak Creek. The wonderful librarian there, Jill Linninger and Sarah Corso, her, her assistant, um, truly, truly pivotal in putting together what we believe is the largest public venue collection of sick materials in the nation, in the nation. It's available to anyone with a library card, and even I think that the, the librarians there will uh, extend some special privileges to others who may come there exploring this sick faith. Again, established in July of, uh, I'm sorry, in April of this year in anticipation of July. 
July and now August of this year in the 20th, uh, 10th anniversary of the events of August 5th of 2012. A collection that includes fiction and nonfiction, an awful lot of information about the Sikh faith, its background, uh, what Sikhs believe, um, what happened at the Oak Creek Temple, a place for exploration. Uh, go to the Oak Creek Library at some point. doesn't have to be this weekend or even next, even this week or the following weeks. At some point, uh, go to that, that location and take advantage of that new collection established by the library, by the Oak Creek librarians, and by a consortium of members of the Sikh Gurdwara. Again, pleased to have been a part of that initiative to place those volumes there at the library. When you go there, when you go there, among the things you will discover is a great deal of information on who the Sikhs are, where they came from, what their faith is all about, and what they practice today. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Let's give you some basic background about Sikhism on the face of the planet and throughout the United States of America. It is, it is, it reigns, remains the fifth largest religion on the face of the planet. Fifth largest, probably boasting about 25 to 30 million people worldwide. Uh, most of them, most of the population, the majority of the population in Asia, but nonetheless scattered throughout, throughout the Kent countries of the world. And that includes the United States of America, where the estimate is between 300,000 and 500,000 six live and work and uh, enjoy, along with the rest of us, the blessings of liberty, including those under the First Amendment. So a large population nationwide and certainly throughout the world, the fifth largest religion on the face of the planet, um, joining many other religions in the expression uh, that is all important to Sikhs and to others. And we're going to chat more about that. So, so who are the Sikhs and what do they believe? Well, again, a congregation of people worldwide about 500 years old began by one of their first gurus, one of their first leaders. His name was Guru Nanak, who lived from 1469 to 1539. He was a, one of the initiating forces in establishing the Sikh faith. And eventually, uh, many of his words and the words of the following gurus who followed him over the course of the next 500 years were set forth in something called the Guru Granth Sahib. That is the Sikh holy scripture. It is akin, if you will, to the Bible in the Christian faith, to the, the um, uh, Quran uh, in, in the Muslim faith, to the Torah and the Jewish faith, other other. Uh, collections of religious beliefs and, and tales of history and of the faith itself. So the Guru Granth Sahib, a collection begun, if you will, with Guru Nanak, added on to by other, other gurus throughout the time. And again, a religion that has been in existence uh, worldwide for 500 years. One of the first uh, Gudwaras, again, the name of a temple, those two words are interchangeable, obviously coming from Guru, uh, the Gudwara meaning the house of the Gurus. Uh, the first ones of, uh, one of those uh, happening in Sacramento, California, and then of course populations in every state of the Union, including including right here in Wisconsin. In, in Milwaukee County, we do in fact have this now place of civil rights history in Oak Creek, right on Howell Avenue, uh, not too far from the city center uh, where the shooting happened uh, 10 years ago this week. We also, right here in Waukesha, have another guru, uh, Gudwara rather, uh, in Brookfield, Wisconsin, where, again, members of the Sikh faith and others can come to express their religious faith. It is significant, indeed, that the Gudwaras always have in the nave, in the central religious area, four Four doors, four doors, and that was very purposeful. From the very start, Guru Nanak said, as we gather together, what we're going to do is ensure that everyone, everyone of all faiths, of all immutable characteristics, of all of all types of human beings, regardless of who you are, uh, what you believe, where you come from, everyone is welcome, and we're going to establish that. We're going to, to quite literally physically incorporate that into who we are by providing four doors into our religious place of worship. And to this day, every single Gurdwara, including in Oak Creek and Brookfield, many other Gurdwaras in the state of Wisconsin, in Illinois, in Indiana, and in every other state, all of them have four doors to convey this expression of welcome for everyone. And indeed, indeed, one of the things that you will discover 
if you travel to and visit a Gurdwara and explore more about the Sikh faith, is that not only will you be welcomed into this community of faith, uh, but you'll also be fed. Um, They have something called a Langer Meal, the Langer Hall, L-A-N-G-A-R, and both before and during and after religious services there, like the services of many other faiths uh, on the face of the planet and certainly right here in the United States of America, you will be fed um, wonderful uh, Punjabi uh, meals and treats and desserts and good foods that are prepared there uh, by the Sikh uh, leaders and by families of the Sikh congregations. And so that's the Langer meal, and that's right there in the the Gurdwara itself, um, also going to play a large role in the observance of this coming week um, of the civil rights violence uh, there that happened 10 years ago. And so what do six believe, aside from, again, this notion of openness and of welcome, not only through food, but also of quite literally of physical greeting as you walk through the door, do not have to be a member of the Sikh faith to worship among them, that true of virtually every other faith uh, entity in the United States and around the globe, welcoming a, a religion, uh, a religious, uh, a person of different religious faith into the religion uh, views of the six in particular. And so uh, what, what do the six believe? And again, much of this, many of, many of the aspects of this are uh, very common to other faiths around the face of the planet. Let's talk about, about some of those. They believe in one God. They believe that uh, that there is one creator of the universe, and again, that true of many, many other religions, as we well know. Um, in the social area in particular, in matters relating to human behavior and conduct, I've already mentioned this notion of the community of all women and men, girls and boys, regardless of how you identify yourself, what your orientation may be, what your identity may be, who you are, where you come from, what your race, your national origin is, your ability, your disability, your familial status, all welcome. And that is because going back for 500 years, this is a faith that understood the equality of all human beings and stressed gender equality um, and other things that, that bring us all together. The, the equal status, if you will, of all genders, all identities, including those of women. Guru Nanak from the very start made that a very important part of his, his commission to his new faith as he was starting that. And we're going to chat more about what the Sikh faith is all about. About, including things like work and sharing resources and service and other things as we contemplate this week the 10-year anniversary, the observance of the sick violence, this major civil rights event in American history that we're going to be observing in just a few days. Join us as we come back here at WAUK The Shaw Morning Cannolis and call in 844-967-2789. statement of the religious belief, but also you will see that on display if, in fact, you go to the Gurdwara and choose to partake in some of the events coming up this coming week. What else do the Sikhs believe? What else is a part of their religious belief, which also also parallels that of many, many other faiths, including Muslims and Jews and members of the Jain faith, Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, others out there. They believe very strongly in the concept of work, of industry, that one should earn a living by honest means, as the as the gurus have said, um, and take what rightfully belongs, uh, not take what, what rightfully belongs to others, share in the goodness and the positive things that come from honest work. That's called karat, K-I-R-A-T, in the original Punjabi. Significantly, also related to property and this communication and connection that the Sikhs have to people in the larger community. The Sikh faith also promotes sharing, sharing earnings, 
sharing the good things that come to you as a result of your hard work, this karat in your own existence, your own life, and sharing that with the poor, people who are needy, as a fundamental pr principle of Sikhism. And again, this notion that when you go to a Sikh temple, not only will they greet you warmly, but they will insist, if you will, on feeding you and doing that in the Langer Hall, this Langer place of, of community, of conversation, and of ensuring that you are well fed. That's a part of their sharing perspective. Key, key to the Sikh faith is the notion of service. Again, common to virtually every other major faith on the face of the planet especially important uh, throughout the lives of the nine living gurus and the tenth guru, which is the uh, Sikh Holy Scripture to this day. Uh, replete in all of that is the notion that service is not only a part of the religion expected of every single member of the Sikh faith, um, it is a commandment, if you will, to approach humanity, be a part of humanity, to ensure that people, regardless of their backgrounds, again, their political affiliation, who they are, where they come from, what their families look like, that in fact we provide service. Six provide service to them to ensure that uh, the world is a safe and secure place. And you will hear this as SEWA, S-E-W-A, sometimes written as S-E-V-A, uh, days of service, uh, days of times where the Sikh faith is celebrated, uh, not so much in the Gurdwara itself, in the physical presence of others, uh, in Inside the place of religious worship, but in the community, serving other people who are out there, who are in need of service and support. Importantly and significantly, as we think about the horrific violence that happened at the Sikh Gurdwara 10 years ago this week, Another important premise, a predicate of the Sikh faith is nonviolence. Peace-loving people um, who stand for truth and justice and recognize that it is not through violence, but it is through communication and, frankly, through the expressions of things that are in their religious beliefs and in their books, uh, but also in our own First Amendment. It is through expression and exchange and communication that the interests of nonviolence and a moving forward without violence can best be promoted. So nonviolence, along with this concept of, of service, uh, seva or sewa, in connection with other people, a very important concept of the Sikh faith. Another important part of it, a meditation called Simran, S-I-M-R-A-N. And you will see as you participate in the expressions of the Sikh faith on Sunday mornings, other times throughout the week, that the members of the Sikh faith do in fact not only remember God, but repeat his name uh, throughout their religious uh, services. Again, something common to many faiths, right? Uh, again, that ties them all together to the community of women and men, uh, boys and girls nationwide. I already mentioned this notion of equality and reaching out to community. Another very important aspect of the Sikh faith is tolerance, and not just tolerance, but, but actually embracing other faiths. A real commitment to ensure that even if you are not a Sikh, even if you have no faith at all, no, no religious affiliation, nothing formal that, that ties you to, to something religious, um, that is not only okay for Sikhs, but you are embraced in that community of all people. Um, this notion that, that Sikhs doesn't, Sikhism not only again tolerates, but goes the next step and says we will embrace you uh, whether you are a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Jain, a Jain uh, faith member, um, whoever you are, a Muslim, uh, you are welcome here and we acknowledge the equality of all of you along with us. That notion again a key element to all of this in service to other people. Understanding uh, equality is key to the faith as well. A part of this, of course, wedded right into it, sewn into the very fabric of Sikhism, is also this concept that they do everything to promote the wellness of the entire human race. Uh, in their daily prayers, they wish for the well-being of all humanity. Uh, Guru Nanak, from the very start, and again, the following gurus all articulated this fundamental view that not only do we act, but we also speak about wellness of everyone. We pray for their wellness uh, to their God, to the God of all people, uh, to things beyond ourselves. And so that also a key element of the Sikh faith. 
And finally, in this admittedly very superficial and introductory sense of, of what the six are all about, um, a concept of self-discipline, uh, controlling passions, if you will, and anger and greed and materialistic attachment, all those things, ego, um, always a part of the Sikh faith as well, ensuring that self-discipline is understood and that whether you are a young person, a part of the Sikh faith, you are middle-aged or older, uh, you have that sense of self-discipline about you as you do the service, as you acknowledge the equality of all people, all of those things a part of the Sikh faith, which you can and you will see on display every single week, including this week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, as our nation, our world, uh, remembers what happened on August 5th, 10 years ago, this coming week. We're going to chat more about those particular events in our final segments here this morning on Morning Cannolis. Also taking your calls, as always, at 844-967-2789, WAUK The Shaw in downtown Waukesha. Welcome back. This is Jim Santel, Morning Cannolis. In our second hour this morning, we're devoting all of our time, all of our discussion to the upcoming observance of the 10th anniversary of the civil rights violence, the human rights tragedy at the Sikh Gurdwara in Oak Creek that happened on August 5th of 2012. The event's coming up later this week in commemoration of that, in acknowledgement of the horror of that, but also moving forward, uh, acknowledging that as we think about the tragedy of that day and the following days, uh, the wonders of resilience, uh, Chardi Kala, which is this expression in the Punjabi faith that in, even in the midst of great violence and great challenge, uh, eternal optimism, eternal optimism, which again, a part of the Sikh belief and Sikh faith, which we've been talking about in this first uh, section of our second hour today. I'm going to continue with this right now and then talk as we move to the final moments in our final uh, period this morning about what you can do to participate this coming week in these important events, again, acknowledging this horrific, but nonetheless uh, monumental event in the civil rights, the human rights history of America and of the entire planet. Right before the break, we were chatting about some of the fundamental tenets of the Sikh faith, including nonviolence and the tolerance and embracing of all peoples and all faiths, wellness of the human uh, discipline and the human race, um, the notion that uh, service is key uh, in understanding and reaching out to all faiths, sharing work, equality of all people, uh, keys, keys to the faith, this 500-year-old faith from its very start. A couple of other physical things that you have probably seen or will see if you have not already done that, and that is the physical manifestations of all those principles by adherence to the Sikh faith. Um, many, if not all, of the Sikhs in this country and around the world observe this, but you will see many of them doing just this. You'll plainly see turbans, and I am reliably told that in this nation, for example, in the United States, if you see someone with a turban, you would can reliably assume that they are of the Sikh faith. About 95, maybe more percent of people, men wearing turbans, are Sikhs. And the reason they do that is that the turban, of course, uh, conceals what are, it's called unshorn hair, long, uncut hair, a natural way, according to the initial gurus and the gurus throughout the time, of living in harmony with the will of God. And again, Sikh women and men typically do not cut their hair. It's called kesh, K-E-S-H. And again, the turban, the turban is one of the expressions, the physical expressions of their allegiance to the community in which they live. And especially at the core of that, uh, to their harmony with all people and the will of the God. And so that turban is a key element, an identifier for all six. Uh, there's also a thing called the kanga, K-A-N-J-A-G-A, -G -A, and that's the comb. And it's intended to keep the hair clean, again, as a part of their religious adherence to all those wonderful and important principles that I described before. You will often see, you will often see, and it has been undeniably the subject 
subject of some good attention uh, in the wake of the uh, Sikh temple shooting to understand the religion, to appreciate what this is all about. Uh, the Kirpan, K-A-R-P-A-N. It is a small sword, and it is carried by members of the Sikh faith. Why? It is a symbol of doing what? Fighting injustice um, is not intended as an offensive weapon, not intended to be an offensive type of thing, but rather an expression, once again, of the faith, the kirpan, worn by, worn by those who are fighting injustice, promoting justice, protecting the weak, and protecting uh, those interests that are a part of the Sikh faith from start to finish. Uh, and finally, finally, you also see um, Sikhs who are wearing the karak, K-A-R-A-H. It is an iron bracelet. You'll see many Sikhs who are uh, sporting that. It's a, it's a, once again, an acknowledgement of all of these principles, a reminder of the Sikh person's bond, not only with God, but with also the entire community in which she or he lives and breathes. One of the great honors that I had many years ago was to be presented with a kara as a result of uh, my involvement uh, with the Sikh temple shoot. Shooting, um, in the context of uh, following up not only in the investigation of that, but also also uh, tending to the victim families and the survivor families in the wake of August 5th of 2012. All of this, all of this much on display at any Sikh Gurdwara throughout the United States of America and on throughout the entire planet accessible to people as you walk in. An expression, again, once again, of this fifth largest uh, religion on the face of the planet, a place of community, a place of service, a place of growth and communication and community. Very much, very much um, following up on our own concepts of that we have talked about on this very show of the First Amendments and First Amendment and the uh, communication that we have with others, free speech, free expression. Again, not only tolerating but embracing others as a way of understanding the community in which we live. Those concepts also as they are with many faiths, faiths also a part of the Sikh faith, Sikhism generally. We're going to spend a lot more time next Saturday chatting about what exactly happened on August 5th of 2012. I was the United States Attorney at that time. It was a beautiful Sunday morning, much like the weather today in southeastern Wisconsin. And sometime after 10:15 or so, uh, this shooter, a white supremacist, a member of a white white nationalist group uh, entered into the Gurdwara in Oak Creek, uh, armed with a 9 millimeter uh, semi-automatic pistol, and began to shoot, as we have seen in so many other circumstances in America before and after this particular event, uh, taking the lives of six people. Uh, we're going to specifically honor and memorialize them, uh, not only today, but in the future as well. And we're also going to chat about the implications of what he did beyond just the taking of those six lives, which included uh, the death following that event on August 5th of a seventh member of the congregation who was seriously injured, died, died much after that. And so that is the event that we acknowledge but not exalt, obviously, and that's an important point. As we think about this period of time, as we go into this 10th anniversary of this civil rights event, uh, the designers, the programmers, the people who are assembling this event, again, very pleased and proud to be a part of this program coming up. Um, not at all in recognition or in any way in acknowledgement of what this shooter did. Uh, that is horrific. That is plainly uh, condemnation of the highest levels. Uh, but nonetheless, an acknowledgement of the importance of the lives that were sacrificed that day, what could have been, the continuing impact of that injury, of those losses upon the families, upon the congregation, upon the larger community. And that observance, that observance is what the coming four days are going to be all about. Acknowledging once again that this terrible thing did happen, did happen at this place of worship, this place of peace, this place of community and understanding, of embracing, but nonetheless um, acknowledging as well 
under the spirit of Chardi Kala, this great movement forward, which is also part of the Sikh faith, this notion that even in the midst, in the wake of that horrific challenge, which we do not forget, we never, never overlook and always have it right before us, the importance that those lives were not lost in vain, that they have a meaning to us today, as they did when they were alive. The injuries also suffered by people to this day as a result of what happened, that too stays with us, and that is the legacy of this civil and human rights event on August 5th of 2012. Those are the kinds of things that will be discussed on Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday of this coming week. And once again, we think about the lives who are lost and today, today in anticipation of the specific memorials to be given and offered in this coming week, we specifically say the names out loud of the seven people who were killed at that time and who, also, who lost their lives uh, in that horrific violence. They are Paramjit Kar, uh, they are Satwan Singh Kaleka, they are Prakash Singh, Sita Singh, Ranjit Singh, and Subeg Singh. In addition, in addition, one of the major uh, priests also killed uh, who died much later. All of those people whose names we say out loud in observance of this important time in our nation's history. We'll talk right after the break about the ways in which you can participate this coming week uh, here at WAUK uh, in southeastern Wisconsin, the Shaw 101 FM, uh, 540 AM. For our final segment this morning at WUK, the Shaw in downtown Waukesha, we're talking about the upcoming observance of the Sikh Temple shooting, August 5th, 2012, this coming weekend, being the subject of lots of discussion, lots of community gathering, including some vigils. And we'll tell you more about that and how you can participate yourself in things in Oak Creek and, frankly, observances around the nation, around the world, that will also be remembering what happened right here in southeastern Wisconsin. Before we talk more about that, let's take a couple of callers. First, Gary from Sussex. Gary, we appreciate your calling in this morning. Hey, um, yeah, I, listen, I, I'm a I'm a conservative, and I call up all the time, and, and periodically I get a chance to talk to you. And I, I enjoy listening to you, and I agree with a lot of the stuff that you say. And for you to get uh, an old conservative guy to listen to you guys is I think you're doing something right. That's a good thing, Gary, um, right? We should all be talking with each other constantly, right? Yeah. Um, I do have uh, two comments. All right. One comment is the guy that went out there and killed these people, which is absolutely horrible, and you call him a white nationalist. I don't know what he was, but he's full of hate, and he's an individual by himself. I don't know if he was a, a member of a group or of anything. I don't know his background. I don't, I don't even want to know what his name is. Sure. But I remember him. I remember the day I was coming home from up north. My wife and I, we heard this. We could not believe it. It's, it's, it's terrible. But the guy's, a, the guy's a loner. He's an only person. I, like I said, I don't think he's a member of anybody's group or anything like that. And he's full of hate. But I do have one question for you. Sure. I don't know if you're pronouncing it correct. I think it's they're called the Sikhs. That's, that's a, uh, Gary, that's a great question. That's a great question. Thanks so much for calling in. I appreciate knowing your comments about uh, how we should all be able to talk and communicate. I'm going to chat more about the uh, specific uh, a fellow who did this, not by name, but in fact, he was, we believe he was a part of this neo-Nazi group, a white supremacist 
supremacists called the Hammerskins. But we'll we'll talk more about that perhaps okay. next time. So there's a lot of information about that we we can chat about. Um, the the pronunciation of the word is a very important thing. There are folks out there who pronounce it uh, Sikhism and Sikhs. Um, my colleagues and friends and close associates uh, refer to the faith as Sikhism, S-I-K-H-I-A-S-M. And when I first became familiar more with the religion, um, I was properly schooled to understand it as Sikhs. That is not to say, that is not to say that some Sikhs refer themselves as Sikhs and uh, they will respond because of the nature of who they are and the way that they engage with everybody. If you call them Sikhs, they will not correct you. Uh, they will say, you know what, we're glad to chat with you. But um, I always use the expression six because I believe that that is the, the proper English pronunciation, if you will, uh, but uh, open to all sorts of uh, pronunciations of that, as are, most importantly, the, the six themselves. But, Gary, appreciate your comment and your, your call in so very okay. much. Um, and, and call in again. We should chat on a regular basis, right? We also have another caller on the line right now, Kristen from Waukesha right here. Kristen, thanks so much for calling in this morning. Hi, Jim. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks, Kristen. Good. Um, thank you for talking about this and for that very lovely uh, description of the of the six faith. Um, I just wanted to, you know, point out again that uh, when senseless acts of violence and murder like this take place, the tentacles into the community are just so long. Um, Brian Murphy, who was the officer on the scene, who, you know, was kind of, I know he doesn't like this word, but the hero of the situation Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And, and sustained so many gunshot wounds himself, is my niece and nephew's uncle. Yes. And so, you know, even out here in Waukesha, these little things all connect us together. And I'm sure there are probably, beyond the six and then seven people who were killed, you know, there's hundreds of people who little by little you realize how many, all of us are connected to one man's, you know, uh, terrible idea of what he thought he should do. So um, I just want to point out again that in this case, unlike other cases we've seen recently, and I don't want to, you know, go into that, the police in Oak Creek ran to the scene and did not think about themselves, but about the victims in the in the Gugwara. Absolutely. So I just uh, want to point that out again. So Kristen, you're, again, it's always your comments uh, so thoughtful and uh, so important to think about, and we'll chat more about that, especially next week. But you're absolutely right. Brian Murphy, a, a, a relative of yours, uh, people who are important yeah. to you, uh, undeniably, we do not shy away from describing him as as a hero. Uh, he is undeniably the one who brought the shooter to, to his end right there in the parking lot. He himself suffered, as you just said, Kristen, 15 bullet shot wounds uh, to this day uh, carries the impact of that. He is going to be a part of the observance this coming weekend, uh, Thursday included, which we'll get to in just a moment or so. A true hero, another fellow named Sam Lenda, who was also there on the scene immediately, Kristen, as you just said, all of these folks from the Oak Creek Police Department immediately descending within minutes of this event. Sam Lenda is the one who took the shooter out, uh, who aimed his long rifle at the shooter and brought him to his end. The shooter himself actually uh, committed suicide in the moment, but Sam also a very much a hero of that day, as are so many other law enforcement folks, as Christian just said, throughout Oak Creek, uh, heroes in the community who came to that area from around the state, from northern Illinois, who responded in a way to provide support and understanding, yes, law enforcement, but also, also just general support for the community that had been so, so impacted impacted by the horrific, as Kristen uh, just said, of the uh, shooter on that particular day. We're going to chat more about the specifics without going into graphic detail so that people remember this, especially in the coming coming weeks and, and days and certainly months and years. We're going to chat a little bit more about the specifics of that next Saturday so that there is history. It's important, as I said right before the break, not only to say the names out loud of the people who were killed, but also to talk about what happened as a way of 
understanding and moving toward that day, moving toward that day when this does not, as Kristen just said, happen again, when we can truly say that this kind of thing um, is not a part of our history um, going forward. And that's also a part of the commission of this coming weekend, uh, thinking about people like Brian Murphy, but also thinking about all the law enforcement, all the members of the community, uh, the congregation members of the Sikh Gurdwara, uh, people like Kristen's relatives who, to this day, impacted those tendrils that she talked about, those those tentacles into the community, um, could not have said it better. And so let's talk in our final moments here today about things that you can do, you can be a part of in these coming days uh, to participate to commemorate this horrific thing that happened, uh, this time of civil rights history that occurred right here in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, again, being observed by the nation and by the world. So four days, four important days coming up, including including presence of law enforcement and the community. On Thursday, on Thursday, August 4th, from 6 to 9, Not at the temple itself, but at the Oak Creek City Hall, 8040 South 6th Street in Oak Creek. There's going to be a program called Protecting Places of Worship. Um, It is going to be three hours long. That sounds like a very long period of time. In fact, chocked full of important commentary, insights, perspectives from law enforcement, from uh, state, federal, local law enforcement, including the federal government, the U.S. Department of Justice, talking about hate crimes, talking about security securing places of worship, talking about community, which again, so very important to the Sikh faith generally. I am very, very proud to be able to say that I'm going to be moderating one of the panels that day that is going to include representatives of all the faiths that we have chatted about this morning, including the Sikh faith, including, including, very importantly, Pradeep Kaleka, who is not only the son of the slain leader, Satman Kaleka, who gave up his life wrestling with the shooter on that day in that morning in the parking lot. Pardeep, um, a true uh, victim, as are others of that criminal behavior on that day. Pardeep has gone on, as many of us know, to be the executive director of the Interfaith Conference of Greater Milwaukee, um, also, again, a continuing community leader. The group that we're going to be chatting with in particular on Thursday night also includes Ari Friedman, uh, a very important member of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation, the director of security and community there, also very important at the time of the shooting in talking with people throughout the community about how other places of religious belief and faith can keep themselves safe and secure. Pastor Walter Lanier of MICA, the religious leaders in in the Milwaukee area, is going to be coming in. He's a pastor of the Progressive uh, Baptist Church, um, uh, very important and key icon member of religious faith, again, in the Milwaukee area, Walter Lanier, coming in to chat about the impact on religious uh, entities of all times, including the Christian faith. And Ahmed Qureshi, Ahmed Qureshi, the past president of the Islamic Society of Milwaukee, the executive committee of the Interfaith Conference, likewise talking about the impact of this in an interfaith way. And so I invite all of you, you have, don't have to, to pay anything to come in to, to see this Oak Creek City Hall. There is some registration for for purposes of ensuring there is proper seating and proper accommodations, go on the website of the Interfaith Conference, even type in Sick Faith, uh, Sick Temple of Wisconsin. You'll find a lot of information about this happening Thursday night, August 4th, 6 to 9 at the City Hall. And then, and then in the days that followed, moving to the Sick Gurdwara itself up the street, a series of days, including Friday, August 5th, the beginning of the Langer meals at the community uh, gathering there. Friday, August 5th, a candlelight vigil at 8 o'clock at the Gurdwara, beginning at 6 o'clock with words and comments. On Saturday, August 6th, a community Chardi Kala, an internal optimism event from 11 to 3 o'clock, a time of community gathering right there at the Sikh Gurdwara itself. And then finally, on August 7th, um, the Kirtan, which is the a hymn that's sung during meditation, tributes to the departed souls by public officials and others, again, in observance of what happened, what happened 10 years ago. Invited to all of that. Go online, take a look at what the opportunities are. Be a part of the village vigil. Be a part of the community gatherings in the coming week. An important issue for all of Americans and for all of us committed to uh, America's uh, concept of liberty.